John chapter number 11. For sake of time, we're going to begin reading in verse number 45. Now to set the stage for you, Jesus just laid, raised Lazarus from the dead. Okay? So, verse number 45 says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary, and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees, and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we do? For this man doeth many miracles. Then if you would, skip down to verse number 53. The Bible says, Then from that day forth they took counsel together to put for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. So, Lazarus just been raised from the dead. Okay, if you go back and read a little bit further back into the story, Martha came out and met Jesus on the road. Okay, that's where that oft-preached encounter where she accused the Lord said, Lord, why weren't you here? My brother wouldn't have died. Then Mary heard that Jesus was out on the road, and then she left the house, and she ran out to him. And it says that there were a bunch of mourners, which back in Bible days was a profession, that they would come out and they would come for you. But I'm sure there were also a lot of friends, a lot of family, okay, people that knew Mary, Martha, and Lazarus that were there to comfort them. Okay, it says that Mary and all of them people also followed her because they saw her get up in a hurry and take off and they're like well something must be happening and they're like well the per person that we're supposed to comfort isn't here no more so let's go to where they're at so they got up and they went then Jesus tells them roll back the stone Martha said Lord he stinks he's been in there for four days and he said shut up and roll back the stone that's not what Jesus said but they took away the stone and he said Lazarus come forth and then he came out now another thing you go and study what they wrapped Jesus in to bury him in that was a rush job okay Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus says that they brought garments and spices and fragrances of a hundred pound weight I don't know about you but I've never been wrapped up like a mummy with 100 pounds of fabric and then smell good stuff. Okay, Very hard to move if you put 100 pounds on you that you're not used to carrying. Impossible to move if you take that 100 pounds and tie you up with it. So when Jesus said Lazarus come forth, he didn't walk out of there. J Lazarus came out because Jesus said come forth. But then afterwards he tells him to loose him and let him go. So how'd he get out? The power of God. Uh, well, what happened? Did he float out? I don't know. He came out, however, Jesus wanted him to come out. But I know G Lazarus didn't walk out of that tomb that day. So then, after they loose him and let him go, he's alive. Okay? Then, we get to where we started reading, verse number 45. Then many w of the Jews which came to Mary, that was the crowd that was mourning with her back at the house, Okay. and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him a bunch of people got saved that day how many? it says many what's many? a bunch that's all I know okay, but then verse number 46 but some of them, who, the Jews went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done they didn't believe but they saw what happened and then they went back and they reported it to the crowd that hated Jesus okay now we don't have time to I think it's if you go back two chapters you're going to find a blind man that Jesus spit on the ground made clay put the clay on his eyes told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam okay the Pharisees interrogated that guy they didn't believe that he was really blind until they brought his parents in and they're like yep that's my son he's been blind from birth then that guy got to testify and talk about prophecies in the Old Testament. And it says that they threw him out of the synagogue. 
They put him out of the synagogue. That meant he wasn't allowed to come and worship and offer sacrifices no more. Because he said, I don't, I, his name was Jesus. He told me that much. He said, I don't know how he did it. I don't know why he did it. But all I know is that once I was blind, but now I see. Right? And if you read chapter number 11, you're going to find out anybody that professed that Jesus was the Christ, the Pharisees were kicking him out of the synagogue which back in that day meant that you was an outcast in society. So all those people that believed on Jesus that day, they went away and they knew that the Pharisees weren't going to be happy with them just like they weren't happy with Jesus. Because they believed that he was the Son of God, the Christ. Okay, well, there were some that said, hey, y'all not going to believe what he did this time. Last, time, last chapter you got angry because he gave a blind man sight. Now he's raising people from the dead again. All right, it wasn't a fluke. He's making this a common occurrence. Okay? Then, if you read down verse 48 down to verse number 52, you find that they've got a plan. And verse number 49 says, And one of them named... Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people that the whole nation perish not. The Pharisees were convinced that if everybody started believing on Jesus, that the Romans were going to kick the Pharisees out of power, and they was going to kick Herod out of power, and that they was going to come in full martial law and lock everything down. Now you say, what in the world does that mean for, you know, these Pharisees? The only reason they had power is because Rome let them have power. And the only power that they had was because people believed they were the ones that were closer to God than they were and could tell them how to get closer to God. So if everybody starts believing on Jesus, Rome's going to realize nobody's listening to the Pharisees anymore because they don't trust the Pharisees. So why do we need the Pharisees? would have kicked them out of having positions of authority. Okay, now, none of that would have been relevant. They'd just gotten right with God and believed that Jesus was Christ. But, as a result, it says, verse number 50 is Caiaphas talking, he says that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. They thought that if everybody gets saved, starts believing that Jesus is Christ, there's going to be some sort of uprising against the Pharisees and against Rome. Go back and listen to what Jesus preached. Jesus preached, man doesn't come to power unless God allows it. Render unto Caesar what Caesar's. You heard that Wednesday night. Right? God says respect those in authority. In fact, pray for your leaders. Why? Because God ordained it that they should come to power. Right? That's not an optional thing. That's a commandment from God. Pray for those that have the rule over you. Yeah, not by accident that they have the rule over you. It's because the will of God allowed it to happen. So they weren't paying attention to what Jesus was preaching. But really, when they say that the whole nation might be saved, what they're talking about is they're trying to save their own skin. They're trying to preserve the way that the political structure had been arranged. Jesus wasn't trying to upset their political structure. Jesus was trying to upset their sin problem. He came seeking to save that which was lost. He didn't come looking for a crown. That'll happen one of these days when he comes back and starts the millennial reign. He wasn't coming to set up his kingdom. He was coming to save those that would believe on him. But they were afraid that he's coming to take their job. So they purposed to put him to death under the reasoning that if one man die, everybody doesn't have to worry about Rome coming in and slaughtering him. Well, just so you know how good their plan was, about 40 years after this, Rome came in and kicked them all out of power anyway. Right. But, if we look down in verse number 54, it says, Then or Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. Because of what the high priests and those that didn't believe on Christ, those Jews that went back and 
told the Pharisees and the high priests everything that had happened. It says that Jesus walked no more openly among them. From that day until you go to the next chapter, until the Passover feast was come, it says six days before the Passover, you find them back at Lazarus' house there in Bethany. Then from there, that's when he rode into Jerusalem on a colt, and they was throwing down palm leaves, shouting Hosanna. And then you're going to find, a few days later, those are the same people that were crying, crucify him, crucify him. Because what they wanted was the Christ to remove Rome's rule over them. Because they knew if he was Christ, okay, being the, you know, the same phrase as the Messiah, okay, that he was coming to be king of king and lord of lords. Nope. He is Christ, was Christ, will always be Christ, but he didn't come to Jerusalem that day as the king, he came as the lamb. They didn't understand it. Even Peter didn't understand that. They came to arrest him. Peter chopped Malchus' ear off. Pulled a sword and said, no, you ain't taking him. Now Jesus said, Peter, you're being stupid again. Picked up the ear and slapped it back on Malchus' head. Right? How you arrest that guy, I don't know. How you arrest the guy that when they said, are you Jesus? And he said, I am. And they all fell down from the power of him announcing that he was God. I don't know how you arrest that guy. But here, it says that the Pharisees from that day forward concocted the plan that they were going to put him to death. Then, in verse number 57, it says, Now both the chief priest and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, talking about Jesus, he should show it that they might take him. In other words, it wasn't just enough to say like, okay, you guys can do whatever you want to to Jesus. That doesn't bother me. No, if anybody heard where Jesus was, they supposed to go tell the Pharisees so that they could come and arrest him. There's only one problem. It wasn't God's will for him to be taken yet. You can go back past a couple of chapters before this. You're going to find Jesus a lot of times on a Sabbath day sitting in the synagogue teaching those that came to hear him. And then you'd always find a bunch of people that weren't there to learn, but instead they were there to try and challenge Jesus. It's usually the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priest, uh, uh, some lawyers occasionally. They're always trying to catch him in a, you know, a riddle that regardless of what he answers, right, they're going to have some reason to accuse him that he's a heretic or that he's blasphemous or whatever. It is. And all, every time Jesus just tells them the truth, then they all get so angry that they want to stone him. And then you're going to find that even though he's surrounded by a whole bunch of people that are angry at him, it'll say Jesus hid himself. Now, if you're in a crowd of people, and you're in the middle of it, and then everybody's around you looking at you, you can't really hide. In fact, you're going to find that it says that he hid himself and walked out, and they perceived him not. You say, now... How do you hide yourself in the middle of a multitude? How do you walk out of a multitude that's shoulder to shoulder, pressing up against each other, trying to get closer to you without anybody noticing who you were? Well, the same way that the disciples, after he had been crucified, were shut up in a house one day, all the windows and all the doors were locked, and it says, and Jesus was in the midst. I don't find that he knocked and they opened the door. No, Jesus just showed up. Well, how did he get out of all those situations? He just disappeared. Same way that, you know, one day, Joshua's out in the middle of the wilderness looking at the city of Jericho, and even though he just, you know, walked, you know, he was, he was scouting things out. He's looking all around. Right? Joshua was one of them spies that went into Canaan Lane and came out alive. Right? This guy knew how to scope, you know, scout a trail and keep an eye on his own back. And yet he just turned, and there was the angel of the Lord. Well, where did he come from? He just showed up. Now, if you believe your Bible, he's omnipresent. That means that he's everywhere at once. But every now and then, he just shows himself out in a certain place. Jesus wasn't no more in that one spot than he was everywhere else in the world. So what happened? He just went somewhere else. Why couldn't they catch him? Because they can't do that. 
And until it was God's will that they lay hands on him and take him as a prisoner to put him on trial, it wasn't going to happen. But the Pharisees, Pharisees still purposed to do it. Anybody here where Jesus says, you tell us, we're going to arrest him. Now, anybody hears about Jesus, if you don't tell us, you're going to be in trouble because you knew where he was and didn't tell us. Eventually, they start offering rewards, bribing people. Where do you think Judas got the 30 pieces of silver from? Right, they started upping the ante because they were terrified that Jesus was going to sh you know, show out. Everybody was going to believe on him and that they were going to lose all authority and all power. Both of which were given to them by God and they didn't recognize that and didn't respect that. But the thing we're going to teach on, that was to give you all the context to what's going on here because I didn't want to read 57 verses today in Sunday school and y'all get angry and try and stone me. Okay? But, verse number 50. For Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews. Now why did Jesus come? He came seeking to save that which was lost. You read about Jesus' ministry. Every time that they accuse him of trying to glorify himself, he says, no, I'm glorified of the Father. I've come to do the will of the Father. I don't glorify myself. It's because the Father chose to glorify me. But I'm not worried about glorification and worship. He says, I came to do the will of the Father. Right? He came as our end sample that in obedience, it's not up to who gets glory and who doesn't get glory, who comes in with tenfold or a hundredfold or fiftyfold. All that it's about is doing the will of the Father. Some plant, some water, God gives the increase. What can I do? I can plant, I can water. It's my job to do the will of the Father. Okay, but it's, Jesus came seeking to save that which was lost. But in verse number 54, he still sought to save all them Jews. Right? He came for God's chosen people. In fact, later on, you're going to find that he came to his own, and his own received him not. And because of that, he went to the Gentiles. Hallelujah, that's us. Right? Unless you're full-fledged 100% Jewish blood today, that includes you. If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus went unto those that were willing to hear him. In fact, you go to chapter number 12, verse number 20, it says there are certain Greeks that came to the Passover to worship. They came to Philip and Andrew. Or, yeah, they came to Philip, and then Philip went to Andrew. And he said, hey, you know, John 12, verse number 20, sirs, we would see Jesus. We want to see Je We've heard about Jesus all the way out in Greece. We think there's something special about that guy. Maybe he might be the Christ. We would like to see him. Right? We came here to worship for the Passover, but it's more important to see him than to do that. We would see Jesus. Why do you think the Greeks had heard about him? Because the Jews weren't interested in listening about him. Uh, well, it says in the Jews' Passover, or verse number 54, walked no more openly among the Jews. He was around them. He just didn't openly present himself. But he was same places that they were. But they would have walked right past him and not even known it. He was there, but he wasn't open about it. He didn't present himself to the Jews, you could say. He was still there. He still desired to save them. In fact, we know how much the Apostle Paul, being in Hebrew of the Hebrews, as he wrote, he desired that his own nation, the Jews, the Hebrews, would come to salvation. That's why so many people believe that he wrote the book of Hebrews. Because he wrote about having such a strong... He said that he would become accursed. In other words, he says, if it were possible that I'd lose my salvation and go to hell for all of eternity, I would do it if all of Israel would get saved. Talk about a love for lost people. Now, if that's how much the Apostle Paul loved the Jews, how much more do you think God loved his own chosen people? But yet, 
says he no more openly walked among them. He loved them more than they knew what love was. Right? He suffered the pain. The Bible says that he was tempted in all points, like we are, yet was he without sin. It also says that, you know, he was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He felt every rejection. He felt every slight and indignation that they threw at him. He felt the rage when they denied who he was to his face after he had just done miracles that only God could do. In fact, that blind man back in chapter number 11, he says, show me one man from the beginning of time that's been able to open blinded eyes. He says, but this man does it. Why, I think he might be of God. And then they tried to shut him up and said that he was insane. And then they called his parents and they're like, no, he's always been blind. I don't know how that guy learned so much about Jesus in such a short, short time. Maybe he had just been hearing about those people while he was out there begging because he's blind and couldn't work. Maybe he just heard people walking by talking about this man Jesus that they'd heard about. But he knew a whole lot about Jesus and he started preaching in Pharisees. They got so angry at him that they kicked him out of the temple. But he said Jesus felt every single one of them indignations. Felt every slight, every jab, every time that they said, Ha-ha, we got you. Even though he knew he was right, because he was God. They keep talking about Abraham, and he's like, You think Abraham's special? I knew Abraham before he ever existed. He says, Abraham died, but I was there before Abraham, and I'm still here after Abraham. They were trusted in their lineage, but he says, who do you think picked Abraham to be special? God. Wasn't anything more special about Abraham than anybody else other than the fact that God chose Abraham. He found grace or favor in the eyes of God. Why did you hear the gospel? Because God was still in the grace and favor business. He was still willing to seek to save that which was lost. But it says that he walked no more openly among them. As I was thinking about that, I just want to teach on this morning on some things that will cause Jesus to go away. Things that will cause Jesus to go away. Jesus is still there. But he wasn't open among them. It says he went to Ephraim, which was close to the wilderness. People don't like going to the wilderness. Why? Because it's wild. That's why they call it wilderness. It's wild out there. Things aren't tamed. Roads aren't paved. It's rough terrain. There's thorns and bushes and everything else in the way. When the Bible says that we're supposed to go to the highways and the hedges... It's talking about the wilderness. Talking about them inconvenient places. To bring those to the master's feast that would be willing to come. But you say, why didn't they go out to see Jesus? Well, one, most of them probably didn't know where he went. But two, John here, who wrote the book of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he knew where he went. Why? Because he went with them. It says, Jesus walked no more openly among the Jews, but there were some that still stuck close to Jesus. Why did John know where Jesus was? Because he's there with him. Some people, I'm convinced, went out to Ephraim with him. I still believe that while he was out there, close to the wilderness, I believe there were those that were sick that were brought to him. I believe those that needed help sought out Jesus to where he was. But he didn't do it openly among the Jews. In other words, he didn't just walk, you know, go back to the beginning of his ministry. What did he do? He took 70 disciples, he paired them up two by two, and then he sent them into cities wide to proclaim that Jesus was on his way. Guess where all them cities were? Places where Jews were? And some of them did that and then said, well, if he told us to go there, we're just going to go and tell other people too. Why do you think there were all these multitudes everywhere that showed up? Because they knew he was coming. 
Right? People had prepared the way of the Lord. John had been preaching out in the wilderness for years. Make straight the way of the Lord. He's coming. And then 35 pairs of disciples go running out and they say, hey, he's not just coming. He's on his way. And he's already here, but he's headed this way. Right? Great multitudes. I mean, he gets into a boat on one side of a whole sea. Right? I understood if it was a pond and he gets into a boat on one side and then he gets off and they're all there waiting on him. No, he sailed across the whole sea. And then he gets off the boat and the same people are there waiting on him. I don't know about you, but in my brain, quickest way between two points is a straight line. But yet, he gets on a boat and goes straight across and they went all the way around and met him there. What he's saying, brother, people are pretty serious about getting to where Jesus was. So I believe those that wanted to see where he was, to go and see him, I believe they found him. Just like them Greeks in chapter number 12 that said, hey, I know you're one of his. I want to see Jesus. And they ran it up the chain. But if you wanted to see Jesus, I believe that there's a way for you to see Jesus. Because he promised that if he came unto him. He no wise catched out. That he's interested in the whosoever's. Right? Even those that had no claim to him. And Jesus, to their faith, said, I didn't come here for you. I came here for God's people. What do you find? I still find that they found grace. Why? Because of their faith. So what causes Jesus to go away? First off, it's a lack of faith. Now faith says it's impossible to please God. You know what will cause Jesus to stop openly showing himself in your life? When you stop believing God. You want to know why Jesus went away? Because these jokers that had every reason in the book. He checked all the boxes to prove unto them because of what Moses and the prophets and everybody else in between had prophesied about what Christ would be. Jesus checked all the boxes for them. They just didn't want to believe it. But how much did he prove it? They were without excuse. But Jesus came and did things that only God said he could do. And these weren't just guys that knew a little bit about it. These are Pharisees. These are guys that had the law and all of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, right? Genesis, Ex Exodus. First five books of the Bible, they had committed to memory. These were guys that devoted themselves to studying what the prophets and Moses had said. If they didn't know, nobody knew. It was their job to know. So when Jesus shows up and starts doing all this, they should have been excited. But instead, they got envious. You can't have faith if you're jealous at the same time. If you're bitter... You can't believe. You know who came and found Jesus? Those that were looking for him. Pharisees weren't looking for Jesus because they thought they had it all under control. Back back in chapter number 11, one of the Pharisees asked him, you know, essentially, Jesus said he came to make the blind to where they could see and make those that thought they could see realize they were blind. And then the Pharisee asked him, well, am I blind? He said, if you'd have seen, you'd have believed. But because you haven't believed, you're not seeing. Right? He came to confound those. At 12 years old, he goes into the temple, and the priests and the Pharisees, they're like, well, what in the world are you doing here? He says, I'm just showing up at my father's house. They said, well, what do you know about God? And then he blew their minds. At 12... But he hadn't started his earthly ministry yet. They was just asking him questions and he just gave them the answers. Right? And it turned their world upside down when he was... Now imagine, not just for a day, or however many days he was there at the temple while Mary and Joseph were looking for him. It says, Jesus for three and a half years, right? according to your Bible after the church, in the book of Acts, it says that these are the ones that turned the world upside down. 
Jesus, after he openly started his ministry, he turned everything topsy-turvy that they thought was true. Why? To show them that they couldn't rely on man's intellect. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. You know what caused Jesus to not openly show himself in your life anymore? When you stop believing that he's the one that can help you. Jesus never rejected any, but if you reject him, he's not going to force himself on you. Why would you get saved? Because you accepted the invitation of the Holy Ghost to believe on Jesus Christ. You repented. You didn't get saved when you wanted to get saved. You got saved when God was dealing with you about being saved. But what do you think after you get saved, how do you think the equation is going to work? It's the exact same. When God deals with you about something, you can either believe Him or not. And because He's long-suffering, He may deal with you about something more than once. But eventually, there's going to come a time that if you don't believe Him, He's not going to openly show Himself around your life. That's the danger of becoming backslid. You can go from being back, backslid to being separated from the presence of God in your life. Not saying that you're not saved. Not saying that the Holy Ghost didn't see you. Not saying that Jesus went anywhere. I'm just saying that He's not openly working in your life. Why do you think you can have the benefits of sonship without obedience? If you don't believe Him, God's not going to do it. If you want to lean on your own understanding, if you don't want to trust the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, God's just liable to let you do it. You know why the Pharisees didn't believe in Jesus? They didn't think he needed them. They didn't think that Jesus was what they needed. Oh, how wrong they were. But you know why Jesus didn't openly show himself? Because they didn't believe who he was. or he did, They didn't believe that he was who he said he was. You know why he went away and didn't openly show himself? Because they purposed that they wanted to kill him. And he knew it wasn't the right time. The father said... They're not going to lay. They're not going to grab you yet. And instead of provoking them, what did he do? He gave them just what they wanted. But what they wanted was the worst thing that they could have possibly needed. You know what they needed to do? They needed to repent and get right with God and then believe on Jesus. You know what everybody else needed to do? The exact same thing. But why did he go away? Why did he hide himself from them? Because they didn't believe. You want to know why Christians get in such a mess? Because instead of believing and trusting God, just like they have been up until that point, they decide that they're going to do things their way. That's a real good way to get Jesus to go away. When you stop believing that this is the absolute and final authority of your life, Jesus lied about it, go away. When you stop believing that God knows best, that God's ways are best, that the, if anything that we do of ourselves is just going to make a mess of it, Jesus is liable to hide himself. You want to know why so many of these movements and things that have people's names on them that bypass the local church, you want to know why God doesn't use them? Because they don't believe that Jesus is what's important. They believe that it's them that's important. You know what Jesus does? He hides himself. He's still there. He's God. He's everywhere at once. But he just steps back. Steps behind that veil, that curtain. He's still just as much a part of you as he was the day that you got saved. But you're not going to see him and you're not going to feel his presence. You know the thing that terrified Job most in the world? That he, he said himself. He looked to his left. He looked to his right. He looked in front and behind him. And he could not perceive God. He knew God was still there. But see, Job didn't have the indwelling Holy Ghost. Job didn't have salvation like we had. You know why he had always been able to look to the left, the right, the front, or behind him and find where God was? Because God showed him where he was. And Job was terrified of the day that, Job, that God would just step back and say, Job, can't see me no more. But what Job say? Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. I still trust God even though I can't see God. But yet how many Christians walk day in and day out 
separated from the presence of God, not separated from God, from the presence of God. That they don't have the palpable, right, real relationship with God because they've decided that they're not going to believe what God said to believe. That instead of putting faith in Him, they put faith in a person or they put faith in people, they put faith in themselves, faith in a preacher. And what's that a real good recipe for? For Jesus to just step back to not openly show Himself to you. Why would He? You didn't deserve Him to show Himself to you in the first place. The only reason He did it is again because He loved you because of grace and mercy. So why on earth do you think you deserve to see the hand of God in your life afterwards? You don't. But I do know one way to get him to go away is you got to stop having faith. What's another good recipe? Well, pride. Look at verse number 49. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. In other words, he's calling them all stupid. He says, Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die. He goes on to say that one man should die for the people and then that the nation would be saved. But his true intentions really come out when you start breaking down what he says. He says, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us. What's he a part of? What group is he a part of? He's a part of the high priest and the Pharisees. He says, It's expedient for us that one man die. It wasn't expedient for the nation of the Jews. It wasn't expedient for all mankind. What they need? They needed God. Now granted, the only reason that they were able to take him and lay him on a cross, they crucified him, but they didn't kill him. The only reason all that happened was because Jesus needed to shed his blood to pay for your sins. But they weren't doing this because they thought it was best for God's will. No. They were doing it because it's what's best for them. He says, ye know nothing at all. What's that sound like? Pride. What's a byproduct of pride? Selfishness. He says, nor consider it that it is expedient for us. He didn't care about the Jews any more than he did. You know, the Easter Bunny. You know who he cared about? Himself. You know why he wanted to put Jesus to death? Because it put his job in jeopardy. Why did he think that his job was more important than Jesus? Because of pride. He didn't want to lose the status of being one of the high priests. Being one of the Pharisees. He didn't want people to walk by him and not recognize who he was or, you know, go out of their way to say, oh, thank you for everything that you do. Give him a pat on the back. He wanted to have authority. He wanted to have a claim. And because of that, he said, so here's what we're going to do. Because you're all too stupid to figure this out. He just said, you know nothing at all. He says, y'all too dumb to put this all together, so let me lay it out for you. You know what's best for us? We're going to kill him. You say, well, that's pretty extreme. Yeah. No more extreme than what people do today in their lives with Jesus. Well, I want to go do that, but I can't do that and go to church at the same time. You know what you're doing? You're killing off Jesus in your life. Well, I want to do that, but i got to give up you know, a little bit of prayer time. I'm going to have to give up studying my Bible in order to do that. You know what you're doing? You're killing off Jesus in your life. You want to know what's going to cause Jesus to go away when your pride gets bigger? When you get too big for your britches and you tell God you don't need Him. It's a real good reason to make Jesus go close to the wilderness. To just step back behind the veil. To where you're going to look around and you don't see him. But here's the thing. Pride will actually make you happy that you don't see Jesus in your life. Because pride understands if Jesus is still showing up, there's going to be a confrontation at some point. 
Pride don't want confrontation. Pride wants what you want. And it doesn't want to be challenged, and it doesn't want to be corrected. Well, if you can live the way that you want to, and God doesn't chasten you about it, according to the Bible, you're a bastard and not a son. You're not saved. But God, being God, may give you a space of grace to where He'll let you come to yourself. The prodigal son, the father didn't go down there to the hog pen and, you know, whip that younger son and say, you know better than this. Now, according to your Bible, he came to himself. In other words, he realized where he was and where he used to be and how where he was was nowhere close to where he should be. He understood that he deserved to die, so he's going to go back and he was going to beg to be a servant at the father's house. He didn't want to be a son, he just wanted to be a servant. In other words, he was asking his father to make him a slave because he knew that he didn't deserve to be a son. Why'd that happen? Because the prodigal son knew better, but eventually his pride got humbled. You think it was any accident that he ended up in the hog pen? No, I believe that that was the hand of God humbling him. He took his inheritance and he did what he thought was going to make it work out best and what happened he lost it all be not deceived God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap but the prodigal came to himself father didn't have to show up and say you know this is wrong prodigal came to that realization on his own God may give you that opportunity but he didn't see the father the whole time after he left the father's house, he didn't see him again until he came back. Just because God gives you a space of grace to come to yourself doesn't mean that God's going to be there the whole time poking you in the back of the head saying, you know this is wrong, you know this is wrong. You already know it's wrong, but you chose to do it anyway. But there comes a point that God's going to reveal himself again, and it's going to be with the chastening rod. But you know what causes them to go away? When you tell them to go away, out of pride. When you tell them that you're not interested in what he's interested in because of pride. When you say, Lord, I know what's best for my life, he'll say, okay. May not do it the first time or the second time that you say it, but it'll cause them to go away. Are you still saved? Yep. But you don't have the presence of God in your life. You don't have the power of God in your life. You don't have the relationship with God that your salvation affords you. And you know what that means? You are, of all men, most miserable. Because you know what's right and you're still doing what you know is wrong. Right, well, you know what else causes Jesus to go away? Look with me, Dan. We're going to pick up again in verse number 51. And this he spake not of himself, but being high priest of that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Well, Jesus did die for the Jews. But it wasn't to make them their own kingdom again. It was to make them the sons of God. It was for them to be saved. That prophecy was true. And not for this nation only, but that he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. And from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death you know what's going to cause Jesus to go away when you stop asking God what you should do when you start taking the wrong counsel who did they counsel with people that hated Jesus why were they a part of that counsel because they also hated Jesus and they wanted to put him to death when it says that they took counsel they laid out plans they had strategies we know that you know they were trying to bribe people well eventually they bribed one of the twelve right? they bribed a whole lot of people to come and tell them where Jesus was and I'm sure they got a whole bunch of false reports because people are greedy but as a result of their counsel they put a whole lot of planes together in fact you go down and read verse number 57 or 56 or 57 
They knew the Passover was coming up, and they said, if he's a real follower of God, he's not going to miss the Passover. In other words, they're saying, it's time to get another plane together. Time to lay out some more snares, some more traps. They weren't going to take him until God said that it was time to take him. But it still says that they took counsel to do it. You won't know what will cause Jesus to go away when you stop asking him, when you stop counseling with God, and instead you start counseling with man. The Bible says that there's great wisdom in a multitude of counsel, but sometimes, right, the wisdom that you get is not what it is that you're supposed to do. The wisdom that you get is, oh, that guy's an idiot. I'm not asking him again. But sometimes you get a whole multitude of cats. There's a lot of wisdom in there. But you know whose opinion matters most? God's. I don't care what you have to say if God said something different. But there are certain things that are not debatable. But we ain't baptizing babies. Not scriptural. You know when you get baptized? When you get saved. You know when you can get saved? After you've reached the age of accountability, which isn't when you're born. According to the Bible, it's when you know the difference between good and evil. And you become accountable for your own sins and your own actions. That, those things, not debatable. But some things like, seek ye first the kingdom of God, how do you do that? You put God first. But what's that mean for me, Brother Jordan? I don't know. I'm not you. I just know that you got to put God in His kingdom first. I don't care how you do it. I don't care what methods you use. As long as you do it, that's all that matters. Now, you can take much counsel. Of, well, how do you do it? Right? How do you deal with this? I know that God told me to be holy, for He is holy. But I'm having a real problem with this. And I've been praying and I've been studying and I know it's the right thing to do and God's convicting me of it, but how do you do it? Right? How do you deal with this? You know what the answer that most people are going to give you is? It's prayer. It's meditating on the things of God. Right? It's getting a Bible verse that when something that used to bother you comes up, you recite that verse, bring back to your remembrance, the Holy Ghost will, not only why it's the right thing to do, but to bring back that conviction deep down in your soul that it's what you need to do. Most of the time, it's just being faithful to do what God tells you to do. It's not always easy, but what it comes down to is, is you've got to choose to do it. But you can ask a whole bunch of people. You're going to find a whole lot of wisdom there. Sometimes people got a song that even on their deepest, darkest day, they sing that song, it reminds them of where God found them, and they get happy real quick. I'm not saying you've got to sing that song when you're feeling down, but I'm saying God may give you a song. God may give you a verse. There's a whole bunch of different ways to put God's kingdom first. All that matters is that you do it in your life. But if you start asking the world on how you're supposed to live, it ain't going to line up with what God has to say. I know there's a lot of ways to do it right, but I also know there's a lot of ways to do it wrong. But how do you know, Brother Jordan? One, because there's a whole bunch of nonsense out there that they say, you know, if you do this, your life's going to be better. Right? They can't even figure out how to deal with money. And you want me to entrust my spirituality to them? Right? If self-help books worked, how come they're still writing them? I'm serious. Right? If Dr. Phil and Oprah were able to solve all the world's problems, how come there's new episodes? Oprah's not. She's done retired. she got her own network now. Right? If Dr. Oz was able to give you all these snake oil things that would keep you healthy, how come there's a new, prog you know, new product? There's a whole bunch of counsel out there, but very few of it's wise. But when you hear a whole bunch of opinions, that's when it's easy to determine between, oh, that guy knows what he's talking about, and that guy's a joker. That guy doesn't know up from down. I'm not going to trust what he has to say. But see, you start listening to the wrong people and start putting your actions into what they say is best for you, 
you start walking away from God, it's a real good way to get Jesus to not openly show himself to you anymore. Because you know what the counsel of the world will do? It will corrupt you. And you know what happens when you become corrupt? You start walking away. A man cannot serve two masters. He'll love one and hate the other. You walk away from God, it's a real good way to make Jesus hide himself. It's a real good way to get Jesus to where he won't show himself openly in your life. It ought to terrify us that there's an equation where the outcome is that we won't be able to sense God in our life, see God in our life, or understand what God wants us to do. But, according to your Bible, it can happen. And it happens every day. But you want to know the best way to keep Jesus in your life? Seek ye first his kingdom. Trust him with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. But most importantly, lean on him. Cast all your cares on him. Trust him. Trust his counsel. Trust his word. Because it will never fail. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.